In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer four fitness and health questions. Four. But we open the episode with current event conversation. We have some fun. We mention one of our sponsors. Here's what we talked about in this whole episode. We start out by mentioning Katrina and serial killers. Uh, listen to the episode to find out why Adam got almost slapped in the face yeah. when he tried to kiss her. Um, I talked about how Apple and Microsoft combined have more worth on the stock market than all of Germany's stock market combined. Uh, oh, American number USA. one. USA. That's it. Then I talked about how the GDPs of U.S. states and how they uh, match up to other countries, entire countries. Uh, we talked about college campus surveillance. I guess we can't watch and monitor our kids enough, apparently. <laughs> then we talked about helicopter parenting and the challenges with our own kids. Adam talked about a duct-taped banana. Uh, look that up. Apparently, it's art. <laughs> then so. we talked about our new sponsor, Legion. Now, Mike Matthews, good friend of ours. He owns the company Legion. They produce high-quality, high-performance supplements, so things like uh, you know, pre-workout supplements, uh, protein powders. Now, Legion only puts in uh, supplement ingredients that are backed by science, actually backed by clinical studies, and he puts the right doses, full transparency. So if you look at the label, you'll see exactly how much there is of each thing. Um, there, anyway, good products all the way around, and we have a discount for you. So if you go to buylegion.com, that's B U Y. L E G I O N by legion.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump at checkout. You'll get 20% off your first order or receive double rewards points for existing customers. Massive hookup. Then we talked about uh, the 6 million Google searches on CBD and had a little discussion as to whether or not CBD was a bubble that was about to pop or if it was going to continue to grow CBD everywhere and explode. Then we got into the fitness question. The first question was, what are some ways to improve squat depth and to prevent butt wink? So butt wink is when you squat down real low and then your hips tuck underneath you. So we have a discussion as to whether or not that should be fixed and if we think it should yeah. be fixed. Not to be confused with the brown eye wink. How do we fix it? The next question, this person wants to know when they're bulking, in other words, their calories are higher and they're trying to gain muscle mass, size, and body weight, how much body fat is too much to gain? So we talk all about bulking, bulking there. The next question, this person went through a severe traumatic experience. They didn't work out. Their nutrition went bad, so they've taken a long break. How do they get back into training nutrition? So we talk about that. And the final question, this person wants to know, uh, through our years of experience in the fitness space, what's the one biggest thing each of us has changed our opinion on in regards to fitness and nutrition? Also, Ooh. all month long, it's a brand new month, new year, most of your goals are fat loss related. Most of you listening to this right now are like, hey, I want to burn off the body fat that I gained over the holiday season. The most effective MAPS program we have for pure fat loss, for short-term fat loss, is MAPS HIT. HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. Now, this is High Intensity Interval Training done the right way. It's all programmed out properly, so you're not just spinning your wheels in the dirt. You're actually burning body fat, preserving and building. There's cool mobility sessions muscle. in there too. There's also mobility sessions in there to work on mobility because HIT can be very intense. That's uh, one of the hallmarks of it. Um, now that program, 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com and use the code HIT50, uh, H-I-I-T-5-0, no space for the discount. I like that song you were singing, Justin. Yeah. Rico. Alea. <laughs> Suave. Remember that song? No, I don't. You don't Rico? remember that? No, you don't, uh, what was his name? Gerardo? Yeah, yeah, something like that. He was like yeah. this, he was supposed to be like this sexy, Rico. like, Latin dude. How yeah. far back? How far back? This was like 90s. Like and early yeah, 90s. Oh, this is like yes. high school? He wore, early 90s? This yeah, is like early. Maybe so. mid 90s. Really? And he wore jeans and like, like, yeah, like shredded jeans and he had like a bandana yeah, and like cowboy boots uh, and he was kind of fit haired, yeah. yeah oh my god Mexican I don't remember Rico Suave you don't remember that? no I don't oh wanna, the girls oh. In now, Sa now the girls in San Jose lost their I'm gonna get everybody minds. singing it maybe that's why I wasn't in San Jose at the time see I, I was in, I was in uh, uh, cowboy capital of the world at that oh time, you didn't so. have a lot of Hispanic <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you were the only yeah, Hispanic yeah. person yeah, I was and I only I only have a quarter representation keep it country oh no in San Jose they went Fucking nuts. Uh, 
for him. Yeah, yeah they weren't doing that over at Oak. He had one song though, right? That Doug, was it. Doug, can you bring him up? Gerardo. G. Yeah. It's a G E R. It's another one of those kind of one hit wonder people, right? Like <laughs> there was a bunch of those. <laughs> there he is right there, bro. Oh, yes, I do dude. remember now. You remember that dude? I do. Yeah, he's got the big hoop earring and and uh, bandana. Dude, what happened? It's a to great him? look. It's a great look, dude. He was fit too. Remember in the video, he's all like kind of jacked yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like rocking the six pack. Wow, I can't yeah. believe you remember this, dude. Uh, he was getting. It was like the whole right said Fred era, you know, like I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my shirt, so sexy it hurts. Like of, everything was about sex. It uh, was, yeah. But his this guy got way more girls yeah. than uh, than than right said Fred. What the hell is his name? Now, was? how do you know that? Uh, probably I don't <laughs> know. I guess because if I was a girl, I'm glad you called it out. I'm glad you called <laughs> yeah. it out. Yeah, I'm tired of always on, calling dude. out his random I facts. I feel like right said Fred yeah. did pretty good. You think yeah. so? I think I guarantee it. He's Who, more popular. I mean, he might. He, All might, right. he might be on the other team. You but just look. I don't you, know. Okay, you just saw a picture of Gerardo. Right, put, like pull look him up, up then. Look up. Right said Fred. Who would you rather he was go out with? He, he had like a, a a mesh shirt and everything. I well, mean, who, the guy the guy tried hard. Who was more famous? Yeah. Uh, right said Fred. That video went crazy. There was like two but guys. Look, okay, though. but look at that. Look at that yeah. right there. Tell me. I think if you had to pick, who would you go out with? I think him or freaking Gerardo. Well, neither one of them are my type. Well, uh, what's your type? <laughs> yeah, yeah, who's your type? I, I typically like females. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, there's that. Well, that's not how yeah. you play this game. That's why I think <laughs> yeah, that's that's breaking the rules, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not that's not fun at all. We're getting literal now, dude. You know what's annoying to me? What? Do you guys see these? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to offend a lot of people. Pick, so, if you have kids and do this with your kids, totally fine. Yeah. If you don't have kids, why are you doing this? These are the Christmas pictures where you got the boyfriend and the girlfriend, and they're wearing like matching. Yeah, pajamas. Like oh, feet bro, pajamas. you can't call that out. <laughs> bro, you, are, you are gonna offend like ninety percent of the population. Bro, but they don't have kids. Just a, it's just a, you know that girlfriend convinced the guy, oh, right? No, oh, just take a picture. And every, it's, like, it's like the shirts that are like I'm with her. I'm yeah, with him. Yeah, they have yeah. every every yeah. guy. Okay, was convinced to wear that if you wanted Christmas sex, dude. You can't, oh, you can't hold it. You can't hold it against that it's guy. Like, it's, I feel like they're the same people that have like joint Instagram accounts. You know what I mean? No, the same people that are like no. way too into Disney. You know yeah. what I mean? Like together like, making no. trips. Yeah. I mean, I, without we, the kids, we don't have, uh, we didn't have uh, matching pajamas by any means. But I, I can't. I, I'll, I will defend those guys out there that are rocking that for sure. They were told by their wives if they <laughs> you, wanted, you Christmas, know what he's doing. If they wanted those Christmas cookies, they better fucking <laughs> get on the. Get, yeah. Get on the pajama train. <laughs> Christmas cookies. That's right. You want you want Santa's cookies. You better you want Mrs. Claus's cookies. You better fucking yeah, want some of them cookies. Yeah, put on the foot pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no cookies hey, for you. Speaking of trying to get some, last night I I totally fucking I haven't seen a dirty look from Katrina in a long time and I got one last night. A good dirty look <laughs> no, or a bad dirty like look? A, like a like a mean look. Like uh -oh, she don't get she don't give me those like oh, mad no. at you looks. What'd you do? Well, I didn't know that she was. Uh, first of all, I didn't know she was asleep. I mean, maybe because she got up throughout the night. With maybe because her eyes were closed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was uh, all the the sleepless night, away. and then getting up at five o'clock to go to work all day long. And I was wondering why she fell asleep at ten o'clock while we we're watching a show. So I I'm uh, watching season two of you. So, oh, I started it. Yeah, oh, so, man. I, so did I. You How far did you get ahead of me? It's two episodes. Oh, so did I. Okay, okay so I'm yeah. on, I'm on episode. So then you'll appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. So. I I dig the show big time. So and my new thing right now. <clears throat> so I bought this thing on Amazon. They had this this I don't know how long this technology existed. I know it didn't exist uh, five or six years ago when I was looking for it before. But you now can get Bluetooth little things that hook to your TV, so multiple headphones can be attached to it wireless. So two or three people can watch yes. something with headphones. Yes. Oh, cool. And it's really cool for me because Katrina's been driving me crazy. I've got this badass round sound. I can't listen to it because the baby goes to sleep at 7 o'clock, and she's like always turning it down. I'm like, I can't even fucking hear it. Mm. And if you're doing anything in the house, like it, it making any noise, I can't hear anything. So I order this, and I, so I got my headphones <laughs> on, right? So I can't hear her. I don't know if she's sleeping or anything. She's she's next laying next to me, and uh, the, it's on the second, second uh, episode of You, and uh, the guy's you know, gives her, kisses the girl the first time, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like just a super romantic kiss. And I, and I grab her face and I, and I whisper in her ear, I want to kiss you like a serial killer. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> she, Smooth. Yeah. She like rolls over and looks at me and gives me like the dirtiest look ever. And then I pull my headphones to the side to like, cause I can tell she's going to say something to me. She, Why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> it's like, 
honey, I'm just I'm just trying to kiss on you or whatever. She's like, I was sleeping. Did you not notice I was sleeping? I'm like, oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> my bad. Yeah, you were trying to do a nice thing though. I, I thought so too. Yeah, you yeah. said it in a weird way. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, how do you kiss someone like the intent was there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, aggressively. In other words, stay asleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me go to work. <laughs> Let me kiss you while you're sleeping. I don't sleeping. know what it is about that show that I like. I think it's so good. It's yeah. got, they, they did a that last real, season was really. They good. did a. You know what I like? I really appreciate really original content. It's hard to make yeah. Yeah. super original content in the in a copycat world we live in today. And so many of the the great hits that we everything from music to movies we watch are remakes of something older. Mm -hmm. It's such an original spin on serial killers. It gives you this inside look of what goes on in their head. And I also feel like the second season's going to have a lot of weird twists. It, it, so far, it's a little unpredictable. Yeah. I'm, I know there's, there's, I don't want to ruin it for people, but there's definitely stuff happening that I'm thinking, this is going to be different. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be different than the first season. It is. It is different. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and it's really good, though. But it gets you inside his mind, and you can't help but watch it and go like, oh, man, now I get it. Like this is this is what goes on in their head when when they when they do because you always see, hear of crazy shit and you go, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Or how, how do you get to this point where you do something like that and you just write them off as crazy or psycho, which they are a little crazy. But when you start to or listen, yeah, yeah, when you listen to the self talk that he's having in the show, the way they yeah. film it, you go like, oh, okay. well, dude, remember Ted like Bundy justifying it the whole way. Remember yeah. Ted Bundy? They caught him. <clears throat> He was in jail. He escapes, and he had to kill like four women on one night. He had, it's like he had this damn this crazy urge, and as soon as he got out, he's like, I got to kill. On a bender. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's like this ah, crazy impulse. He was all pent up. Yeah. Oh, so disgusting. Yikes. Dude, I was, I was looking up uh, some economic uh, statistics the other day, and I came across some crazy... Insane statistics. Check this out. It's going to blow you guys' mind. I've never said that as a sentence, by the as way. As a sentence. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I looked up some crazy economic statistics. <laughs> it's going to blow your yeah, mind. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on to your shorts. You guys Mic ready? drop. Yeah, that's yeah, how, I, get, that's yeah. how yeah. I turn on, Justin. Yeah, I'm just yeah, ready. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm like, hey, babe. Did you see the uh, you pour it on, pour Did you see the question like, that oil. Justin sent over to the, the Mind Pump thread? No. And I posted on the, the people's prediction of what we were like in high school. Oh, yeah. no. What did they say? Oh, it's so funny, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'll read it. I'll read it later. I posted it on my story, so it's in okay. my story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so no, this is actually this is wild, right? So, the the combined market cap of Apple and Microsoft by themselves, so just Apple and Microsoft, is two hundred fifty billion dollars higher than the entire market cap of the German stock market. Wow! Wow! So, what? two companies have uh, they're more higher value, Apple and Microsoft, than all of the German stock market combined. <laughs> How insane is that? Two That's companies. Crazy. Two yeah. companies right there. Here's another one that's, that's crazy. That's a lot of power, dude. I looked up the the uh, U.S. state GDP. So these are the, like, like the gross domestic product of individual states, and they compared them to other countries. You know that uh, California's GDP, just California, oh, is yeah. equivalent to the United Kingdom. <laughs> just 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 California. Wow. Texas is equal to the entire country of Canada, just one state. That's just to show like the. Economic USA. magnitude USA. and power. So when you hear country. that, do you ever? I mean, what's your thoughts? Like, if we were to divide us up more, like our states would have more liberty per state because of that. They're almost like countries by themselves. Oh, like, on their own. Yeah, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. I think that the way that we have it designed, to I think where, it's worth exploring the idea, or at least having conversation around it. Yeah, Why? Well, because you're trying. You know what'll happen, right? Everybody will kick California out first thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> first thing, they'll be like, get out of here. We don't want to deal with it. Texas, Texas will be trying to leave for a while there, aren't they? Yeah, they'll leave they're on their own. into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're already out of yeah. here. I think it would be interesting, but the way that it's designed, I think, is smart because the states do have a certain amount of power over how they run themselves. And so you can see what is more, you know, what way is more effective than the other. Um, one of the best ways you can do that is by see by, by watching uh, migration of people. So which states are attracting more people and which states are losing people. Mm. And for example, California has been bleeding residents for a while now, and it's been losing people to the second most. Is it still? Are mm -hmm. we still like technically year over year? It's actually losing. Is it's, that true, Doug? 
Yeah, it, it definitely is. feels that way. I know a lot of my friends know, have left. I feel like people always yeah. still migrate to the to the water and the coast. Like it's so we, unreasonable. We man. do, but we have it's a net loss. More people leave. That's not, I'm curious. That, that's true. Uh -huh. it is. More people go to uh, uh, like a lot of state people. Now go that's to Texas. interesting to me because our housing market continues to rise year over year, decade over decade. Depends where definitely jobs here. Mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah, you you would think that it would be. It, it depends where. It depends where in California. So like the housing, uh, the houses in. The Bay Area and the coast, uh, Southern California, that is continues to climb. But that's also a uh, that's also a uh, a product of of the supply. The supply yeah. of yeah. See, there you go. From two thousand, well, that's that's a it's not super um, recent, but yeah, that's, but that gives you an idea still. Yeah. Wow. But, wow. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. But I mean, but, I, it feels like a lot of the tech companies are trying to look elsewhere, like to to plant other locations, and then eventually like take all the employees and go in that direction. It just doesn't feel like it's sustainable the way that like California is is taxed. No, the supply of houses is low. That's one of the reasons why it's so expensive. Part of the reason is because of the regulations that we have for building. Yeah. It's hard and expensive to build. Um, new properties. So you have a lot of people fighting for fewer homes. Of course, the pay in the Bay Area and the coast is really, really high. Um, California, though, has the highest poverty rate and it also has the highest disparity yeah. between uh, wealthy and the poor. And you know this when you drive through California. You oh, go, it's very visible. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. parts of California you think it's a completely different- you It's know, like a wasteland in certain yeah, parts. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, crazy though, Haji. Huh? And so most of that GDP from California- comes from the Bay Area and the coast, uh, the vast majority of it. The rest of it's like agriculture and stuff. Damn. Anyway, kind of well, cool. Well, that's super that interesting. Crazy. Yeah, super interesting. Hey, speaking of tech stuff, did you see, you You know that they're doing this in uh, college campus. I know Syracuse does this, and there's a couple other big uh, colleges that are doing this where they are like full-time monitoring the students through Bluetooth. What do you mean full-time monitoring? So like, like Big Brother stuff? Yeah. So like all the class, and, and, and they, they originally did it, um, for attendance to encourage kids to show up to class and and to penalize them for not going to class. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have all in all the, the classrooms, the library, all these places all over the campuses, there is Bluetooth and then it's, and it picks up the kid's phone. So the kid walks into a classroom, it registers that, oh, he, he made it to his, his third period class. Or, oh. See, I would hack that and just give it to somebody to sit in for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure some You know, kid. like, there's always ways around that. You know what's funny? You would do that, I would do that too, but kids today would look at leaving their phone with somebody else for an hour and a half like, like oh, that's a good oh point. my God, this is the That'd be like giving an arm up. You get another phone. There's no way, no way a 17-year-old a, a kid. He's you, right. You give him the shitty phone. He's right. You just get a different phone. Yeah. Well, you you're not that. a Rich kid, how many kids can afford two iPhones? I mean, the ones that go to college. What do you mean? Are, uh, what do you mean? Okay. What do I mean? Who do you know that has two? Well, that is not a drug dealer, bro. Most kids. What are you? Nineteen ninety right now. Most kids <laughs> have, have two iPhones. Have an old one and you a get new the one. Old, yeah, you get the old shitty one. Yeah, yeah the same. Yeah. You got to pay for two separate phones if you want them both to work. Not uh, the Bluetooth. Service. The Bluetooth, I think, will work no matter what. Yeah, I, think so. uh, I don't yeah. think you need to connect to any. anyways. You yeah. can connect to Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's a terrible argument. You can connect to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth without having a phone being active. I know this because I'll I give feel like there's a where there's a will, there's a way. You yeah, know what I mean, I it's think not, it, I think be, figuring that at, at that point it's just easier to go to fucking class. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. like you're trying to hack the system so bad you're spending money on two cell phones. I mean, phones, I would just do that as like a point. You yeah. know, like stop <laughs> monitoring me. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's yeah, funny? Bullshit. You know what's funny about that with kids? Because I'm dealing with this with my kids. Like my so my son has you know he has his computer, he has a cell phone. My daughter has an iPod, iPad now. She got for Christmas, and my my ex wife put all these like parental controls and all these different things on them. And I laugh because I'm like, you really think that we're more tech savvy than these kids? Right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, so this was the, the reason it's why like I brought it up was their phone. there's a little bit of debate around whether this is good or bad. Uh, uh, and there, some people are uh, complaining that it's a, it's a bad strategy to encourage kids to go to class by trying to, you know, fear, get them from fear. Say, sure. oh, you know, you're going to get penalized if you don't go to class. And How so much are we going to monitor kids? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. At some point, then they have to kind of grow up and, and deal with their own consequences. So that's the point, right? So that's why I was curious to hear your guys' opinion with kids that are older, they're heading that direction. Like, you know, do we, do you want to monitor one? Do you want to encourage them to do things? Is using tech in this, this way a good thing or is it more just... You know, more helicopter parenting. Oh yeah, it that's is an dude. extension of helicopter. Parenting it is, but me. I mean, adolescence has been stretching out now for decades. I mean, obviously, we were more watched than our parents were, and mm -hmm. they were more watched than their parents. It just keeps keeps growing. Kids now don't even get li driver's licenses yeah. until they're twenty. 
You know, I know a lot of kids, oh, my, 20 years old, no driver's license. Oh, my little, fear is just not the good motivator. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're never going to like become what, you know, what you think they're going to become if they're just like basing all their decisions off of fear. Totally. Totally. Anyway, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. It's like, uh, I mean, we, uh, wasn't that long ago where you left the house and you were gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? We got to wait until you get home to know where you're at, you know? know. Now they have like watches. I know like some, some of these other parents that we hang out with are always like trying to convince me it's a good idea to have these watches for the kids. So it's like, you could, you know exactly where they are based off the satellites. So they just like, if they walk on, on the playground, you know, they're off at this like beer garden doing their thing. And, and the kids are just like, I'm like, no, I want to, I, I want to at least have like the corner of my eye seeing them, you know, visibly. Like, mm -hmm. if I, so I'm like still kind of, that, that's a part of me. I want to be able to be there physically, you know, for a while until they get a little bit older. Yeah. Are there things right now that you guys are both currently going through, like with the age of your kids that you're, what's like the most challenging thing right now? Like the, like that you, you wrestle with yourself or with your partners, like on how to handle or not handle, like what is current, because I know you have different ages. Mm -hmm. So Justin, what are, what are the things right now with your boys that you and Courtney wrestle back and forth with as far as like, should or shouldn't do or maybe one's too conservative about something and one's too yeah. liberal about something what's i think i've stretched uh, I, i'm more pushing for them to have more autonomy and like do things to figure things out for themselves and and like one of those is walking the dog and like going a little bit further like so like they have like a trail that now i've convinced courtney it's okay like they can go by themselves with the dog and they go for a certain amount of time and you know if they don't come back within that time, then we can sort of walk out. But like she, like, like it makes her sweat. You know, like she's like, where are they? Where are they? And the other one was like, have like taking the bus because she's always like been picked up and dropped off at school yeah. forever. I'm like, they don't need to do that. They just jump on the bus with their friends. Yeah, come home and then walk home. Like that's all part of the experience. Like why are you picking them up all the time and like babying them? You know. But yeah, so we go back and forth with a lot of those different things. So I'm always the one that's a little bit more trying to stretch, uh, so they so they can like like work through this more themselves. freedom, more yeah. challenge, more did freedom, you, more challenge. Did you guys take the bus when you were kids? <laughs> yeah, you did. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I never did. Oh, I never took the bus. Oh, dude, right. I I didn't just take the bus, bro. I'm I walked that, for miles. I'm too, that dude. yes, yeah. I'm that bullshit story that like old grandmothers <laughs> make up about yes, walking dude. up. I literally walked miles to my bus stop. Dude, okay, because I live like, in the country. So yeah. when you live in the country. It's not like the city. In the city, the bus stops at every fucking stop sign and picks kids up. Yeah. Yeah. When you live in the country and you know, and every house has got, you know, you know, quarter miles between each house, the bus stops at one spot and the the thirty houses that are within a ten mile radius have to all so come. You like, have to drive your kids to the bus stop and drive. I mean, them off. if we were lucky, yeah. my mom would drive us to the bus stop, but no. Most, most more often than not, we had to walk to the bus stop. And when I went to my first year of high school, I used to have to because I, the high school that was in the small town that I was in literally had fifty five students in the whole high school, oh, wow. and I wasn't and I didn't want to go there. Was it a barn? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't want to go there. The next like legit high school that had like sports and a, and a, a like a normal high school that had thousands of kids mm -hmm. was a good hour and twenty minutes away from me, which is up in Mariposa, and so I used to have to get up at five o'clock in the morning, hoof it to the first bus stop where it would pick me up at like 5.30 in the morning, uh -huh. and I'd get on that bus. I'd be all by myself. It'd be the first bus. That bus would then link up with another bus by like 6.15, and then I'd catch that bus and ride that for the rest of the hour, hour and a half till we get to school. Yeah, What would you do on the bus that whole time? I'd lay in the back so I because I was the only kid, so I'd get all the way in the back, and I, I would lay across the aisle and, and, on, and sleep. And then I'd, she'd wake me up when we get to the first, the, the next bus exchange. And then I'd go climb on the bus again, go to the back, fall asleep until kids start piling in like a half hour later, later or so. So yeah. I'd sleep. That was my routine. Do you dude. have like good conversations with the bus driver? No, I was all in the back. I'd go all the way to the back wow. of the bus. And uh, yeah, no, the, you're, you're uh, if you sat in the front of the bus when in, you're a dork. Yes, yeah, totally. you're a dork. So yeah, you're yeah. on the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah you went yeah, the back of the bus. I, I used to walk because our house was close to the school. So I would just walk to school. So I never didn't, I never took the bus uh -huh. except for field trips. And uh, that's I thought the bus was cool. Although it is interesting that buses don't have seatbelts, which I find I know, right? Yeah, strange. It's so liberating, and though. They, I love it. And they haven't changed the design uh, uh, that much, have they're they? Like, they're like uh -uh. tanks, dude. Yeah. yeah. 
I feel like you know what it is, right? They have contracts with these bus makers. They have no <clears throat> incentive to create. Why innovate? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the state's going to buy your, point? your bus anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to look the same. You're going to have bunches where kids you know, it's, slide it all works, you know, slide it's all over the place. So what about, what about yours right now? What's the biggest thing that you wrestle with right now? You know, both of my kids uh, really identify with, uh, like, sometimes can be a little bit perfectionist. And so what I struggle with is I really monitor to make sure they're not doing too much. Because my son will do hours of homework, and my daughter will do her homework. She'll do her projects an hour early. I mean, excuse me, a, a week early. And sometimes they get a little stressed out. So really, that's the big struggle: is are they pushing themselves too hard? Do I? How do I get them to kind of pull back a little bit? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, my kids are too good. I have to fucking. <laughs> no, hey, you know what? That can <laughs> gotta be, make time for her. You know, that can, messing around. That can be just yeah. as big. That can totally. be a big problem, dude. No, you know? your son is grinding right now. That's <laughs> he, cra- I'm, in, I'm impressed. Dude. He it's does, crazy. but but then he comes out of his room and he looks like a zombie. Looks like a ghost. Dude. Yeah, and I'm like, you need some sunlight, buddy. Let's go sit in the backyard for a little bit. Yeah, dude. You get some sunlight on your face, so. But they seem to like it. They seem to enjoy it. I'm just keeping. How's it an going eye. with his friends? You know, and like, are they going through the same thing that go to school with him? They do, but then on the weekends, you know, when he's like free or whatever, they'll 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 mash out on video games for hours at a time. Yeah. And part of me doesn't want him to do that. Part of me wants to, be, but that's the way that they connect. You know, and because he works so hard, I and want it's to let an him outlet. Get some of that. You know, it's like it's it's a fun thing that they do. So it's like it's hard to take that away. It is, and that's how they connect nowadays. Yeah. You know, they don't really go over. And if they do go over each other's houses, you know what they do? Play video games. So yeah. they'll, they'll yeah. set their computers up next to each other. And then play play video games. Video together. games are awesome. It's, yeah. it's tough, man. I, I, I get it. Actually, I saw a study that showed that there were the connection between uh, there was a connection between social media and TV uh, usage to anxiety and depression, but they did not connect. They weren't able to connect video games to that. Hmm. Isn't that weird? That is weird. So kids who played a lot of video games, they weren't able to find a connection between that and anxiety and depression, but people who are on social media a lot and watching TV a lot, that hmm. was connected. So I wonder if it's because... Are they like, because they're working together and they're like problem solving together? It's not just like some bullshit like exchanges like I on think, social media? I think so. Well, your your brain, think about how your brain's having You're to solving work. things. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. I mean, the games today, That one of the reasons why I can't play video games with kids anymore is they just gotten so complex. I know. Dude. I mean, now they got 12 buttons and there's like and so the many... maps are so vast and Yeah, crazy. you got to memorize all the map stuff. You got to, all the combinations with all... I mean, it gets, it's... You you can't come into it and like play it and be good at it mm-hmm. within the first couple times of playing. You yeah. got to play a lot. To yeah, play. it's it's funny because uh, I I was like really close to getting the new like the PS4, not even the new ones, like like old now, but because it came out that new Star Wars game, I'm like oh my god, I can't wait. But I was like hesitant because you know obviously the kids like they get really into it, and so this year I I tried to to gift things that were still promoting outdoor play and everything, and like just like experimenting with other stuff and. You know, I was like, uh, put it was a risk because I didn't know. Like, but my youngest, I, I built this um, this tether ball set up outside, and he fucking is out there for three hours straight just by himself. Like, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Oh, just awesome. punching it. And that, that made me so happy. Like inside, I was like, oh, that was a win. Do they dude. still do tether ball at schools? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that was a fun. Yeah, he's like all about it, dude. Yeah, so. that was a really fun game. No, I watched my kid play like a, a first person shooter or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand what's happening. He'll he'll, yeah. he'll move and jump and bounce, and then boom, take someone out with a headshot. And I'm like, how did you, yeah. how did you know when to, you know? They're just so good at, and, and I at think that be- kind of high and eye coordination. And I think because of that, I think that's why there's not the same connection there, as there is to like watching TV, just because that's kind of mindless, right? You watch yeah. TV, and there's not a lot you going sit yeah. there. Bleh. And social media, you're watching other people have a better life than you or whatever, and making yourself feel kind of bad about yourself. And then with video games. They do tend to play with each other. The vast majority mm-hmm. of the time that he's playing, I, he's on his headphones and he's talking to his buddies and they're yelling and having a good oh, time. You can create things, dude. Like, that's the thing. Like even Minecraft, like you can just create so many things, new worlds. Now it's the thing crazy. with my, my friends and I were like just like that too. Like we did the same thing. We were crazy where we hooked up TVs and did that where all day we played. Mm-hmm. But we, we, we did, uh, we kind of self-regulated. Like it, it, our parents would let us do that for three days straight if we wanted to. But after about like you start to get five, six to hours, work. we'd be like, uh, let's go, let's go play ball for a while. Yeah. And then we go play ball outside for a while and, and, and take a break from it and mm-hmm. then come back in and play again. Like that was kind of like a weekend. We'd go over to each other's house and it would be split up between playing either basketball or football 
and and uh, like playing video Golden games. Eye. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And you rotate. You 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 muck out for a few hours, and then you you're done, and then you then mm-hmm. you go play some sports, and you come back, and you do that. Otherwise, you do. You feel like a zombie when you've been staring at the screen for like. I, I you feel it. Your eyes get all groggy, and you mm-hmm. feel all. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, I can see it, man. Yeah. Comes out of his room, and I'm like, whoa. Buddy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Here's some. Here's some food and some sunshine. Let's yeah. go get some. <laughs> Let's get you the sun. Get hey, have sun you guys seen the, the world? Have you guys seen the the duct tape banana phenomenon that's happening right now? The what? Uh, you guys haven't no. seen it either. Is this another challenge or something? No, no. Okay, so I didn't know what this was. All of a sudden, I started seeing people popping up, like duct taping bananas to shit. It's like, the, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? So I, I Google it and I started looking into it. Like onto things, like they're duct taping bananas everywhere. Yeah, they're, what's happening now? The phenomenon is everybody is doing it and making fun of it. But what happened was, an artist at the, I think it was a, a Miami art show just a couple weeks ago or a week ago, even though it's just re- very recent. Uh, duct taped uh, a banana uh, against a, a canvas as a piece of art and it auctioned off at like a hundred and fifty thousand no, dollars and he sold like four of these <laughs> no it didn't yes a hundred thousand dollars hundred and fifty thousand dollars like between I think that, that's between. the most frustrating form of art multiple you know, when they do shit like that and you're just you know like, what I feel like I feel like it's, it's an empty box I feel like the people that buy shit like that are it's just a way of showing off how, like they have so much money it's exactly like, so I was I was reading articles on it and like, like I'll buy that all these re- all these reviews and that's Whoa. one of the things that someone's saying is like you know can you consider it art? And the the one of the guys that I was listening to that was doing a review on it, it's like, listen, if someone creates something or does something and calls it art, it's art. Doesn't mean it's good art. It means it's art. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. And and people that it's are lazy, somebody these millionaires and billionaires that are spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars, it's as uh, it's the same as you or I putting a quarter in a bumblegum machine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. You see a stupid little toy that you would probably, you'll probably never play with. You'll probably throw it in the trash when you walk away. You have the dispensable income to throw a quarter in there and do that. The ratio of how much money you make to 25 cents is that $150,000 to a billionaire yeah. is like a quarter to us. No, that makes sense. And, I guess, and I, so it's funny to be with all your friends and be like, 100,000, 120, no, 130, yeah. you know, 150. For a tape banana. Yeah, that's right. For a duct tape banana. You got it. Yeah. Now that's the kind of stuff that makes people pissed off. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, of angry. course. And then there's outrage people that are- yeah, there's, like home, there's like homeless people, people who need food or whatever. Just, yeah. And you're buying a duct tape banana for a- Hundred thousand dollars is a joke. That's crazy. Yeah, you know, there's there, there was this one woman. You want to talk about crazy art? She would take colored liquid, give herself an enema, and she'd spray it on, <laughs> on on a big piece of just like paper squat over and just splat. yeah, and she would paint that way. Wow, she'd paint by spraying out. Was she good? Was I mean, she good? at least there's a talent. Which I was gonna say, was yeah. she good? I mean, I don't. How good can you be? <laughs> was it Bob Ross good? I no, mean. no. I don't think you. It just looked like spray. Because that would be the shit. Literally, yeah. Literally. <laughs> this is a happy cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, people I think would pay to watch her do this. They'd watch her create her art by spraying. It's kind of hot. Liquid? Nah. What? <laughs> kind of hot? Not really. That's weird, Adam. You just you just went too far. That's disgusting. I'm gonna change the subject real Gross. quick. Yeah, dude. Uh, so Legion. We're yeah. Working, we're gonna be working with Congratulations. Legion. Congratulations. Uh, I feel like Sal, he, he's been trying for a long time. Well, uh, Sal and Sal and Mike have been working on this for a, a long time. Yeah. Uh, Sal had been trying to convince us for a long time uh, to do this and work with Mike and. I mean, Mike's a, a great friend of all of ours. Oh, uh, he's a great guy. Well, and, you know, the the supplement space is full of just charlatans just ri- and yeah, shenanigans, just riddled with garbage. Especially the you know muscle building, fat loss kind of like that more the performance hardcore. driven supplement. Yes, space. and the thing about the, the thing I like about Mike is first of all he doesn't overhype uh, his product. So if you watch his commercials or his ads, he doesn't sell it like it's magic. He's yeah. always very honest. This is how it works. This is what it does. Reasonable it, doses. This is what it doesn't do. Yeah. Then his products have uh, the only things that have clinical evidence. He doesn't ever put ingredients that. In fact, there was there was a one product a while ago that he actually took an ingredient out because he's like, I don't. The clinical evidence isn't enough. I'm going to take this ingredient out. So all of his stuff has. He only puts stuff in there that's got evidence, and then he puts the doses, the efficacious dose. So, you know, if, if studies show that, for example. You know, theanine works with caffeine, which it does. He's going to put what the studies show to be the efficacious dose. He's not just going to sprinkle in. Which I think you you have to talk about that for a minute because this is what uh, the people that are making the most money in the supplement industry 
are the people that are are pixie dusting because yeah. a study because their margins are huge. Well, and and the average person like the average consumer that is buying supplements knows what creatine is, right? right. They they know what citrulline is. They know what beta alanine is. They know what BCAAs are, right? But they don't know what the studies say about how much of that you should take right. to get the maximum amount of. They're just uh, looking for more. Well, right, they're, right, or they're just or looking, whatever. or they're just looking for they're it. They're just yeah. looking for it, right? For it to be in there. And mm. supplement companies know this: that okay, these are the. Can I put if I can put a BCA in there? If I could put a citrulline in there, like a beta alanine in there, I could throw a creatine in there, throw some caffeine in there, and all you got to do is put a, a little bit in there just to show it on my label that it's put there. Put a lot of caffeine, a little bit of everything else, right? So People are going to feel it, yep. and mm. they're going to feel like, oh wow, this is working because I can feel the caffeine, yeah, which no. is really cheap for you to put in mm. there, and all the things that cost a lot of money you pixie dust that's right absolutely no i'll give you a couple examples so like you look at his pre-workout which his pre-workout is uh one of the better ones out there again because it's got stuff where there's actual you know evidence to show that it will improve the performance of your workout and he has it in doses that the studies uh, support so like uh, you know like when you look at like beta alanine for example beta alanine in studies you need to take like three grams of it for it to really for you to really get any kind of a performance benefit a lot of companies will put one gram in it or 500 milligrams. Sometimes they'll use milligrams because it looks like a bigger number knowing that the consumer doesn't realize that a milligram is way smaller than a gram. So it right. looks like, oh my God, this has 500, but that's only half of a gram. Or uh, you know, theanine, for example, studies show that a one-to-one -one ratio or sometimes a two-to-one ratio of theanine to caffeine is what's efficacious. He puts that in his pre-workout. So his, and, and everything's very transparent. He doesn't use proprietary blends, so you see exactly what's in there. And then the other thing is he doesn't sweeten stuff with artificial sweeteners. All of his sweeteners are well, the, natural. So his the, and he's got a is the people who buy his product. Here's what really sold me is that his the people that buy his products continue to buy his products. Mm -hmm. And he's got such good ratings because of all the stuff that I talked about. So you know, for those yeah, reasons, it's because like, of the integrity. Well, yeah. I mean, since day one, the, the message from us has always been that you know to target all of all of your nutrients through through whole natural foods. There's no supplement on the market that's going to make this crazy, drastic difference in your body composition. Totally. Uh, that, that's it's. And he it, says that in his ads. Right, right. That's and 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 here, but there's still people at the high performance level that you know the one yeah. percent difference they're hitting all us. strides and now this is another thing and we get asked all the time and we've been i've been referencing mike i know all of oh, us i tell have, people about it anyway yeah i've been dri i've been driving it. people to his business for you know that ask me where would you get a reputable creatine who do you think is the best pre-workout who do you like for whey protein it's like so I've been dry. We've all been driving people his directions, but so officially now, uh, Mind Pump and uh, Legion are partnered up. Um, we have some really cool things. Another thing too that w obviously made the difference was, you know, we didn't want to just do, uh, you know, repping uh, Legion. We also wanted to work at, like a, a partnership with Mike and create something together, which I'm I'm excited that we're going to do some stuff in the first quarter. Uh, that'll be. We'll probably announce that, um, and, and at the end of January, February time, what's coming uh, down the pipeline with him. So I'm super excited uh, just to be working with a good buddy of ours. I mean, Mike's such a great guy, and look forward to what we'll be doing with him in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, hey, I have dude. something. I have something that I wanted to sh uh, tell you guys too. Bro, which, your dog just fucking <laughs> he's just dropped. blasted you, dude. <laughs> Bro, so he just great. dropped the worst fart ever, and, and, and it's oh like totally God, pointed. It. It's pointed it. right at you, dude. Bro, I can't even. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, great can, move. I can't. You breathing through my mouth isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> the funny part is he's dead. Bulldogs can can bomb, bro. Uh, bad. Yeah, yeah, bad. They, yeah, they are bad. You know what's funny though is when it's when it when it's really bad, and it wakes him up. <laughs> so the funniest thing ever will be Dude. he'll be sleeping like he is right now, right? When we're watching movies or something. Wakes they, up all confused, like, oh, oh yeah. He gets up, and he's like, that? he's looking around, like, and it, that was, bro, that was you, dude. <laughs> that, that was you that just woke yourself it's up. It's funny so because it. it smells like dog food poop. I can almost smell the dog food that he eats plus poop. <laughs> I'm so glad that's wow. aimed right at you. That's so bad. He just black crop that's dusted you. Terrible. <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. No, with that. I was gonna bring up. Uh, they, so I was reading this article on. Uh, Google searching for CBD and uh, 2019 uh, 19, they're they're hitting like over six million searches for Google and they project that to increase by another hundred and twenty percent over 2020 so yep the yeah. market I mean it's it's now surpassed uh, acupuncture meditation all these well, other it's legal in all states now right the hemp version. 
Uh, it's not legal everywhere, uh, but and the states that it is legal, it's obviously searched more. Uh-huh. So that was in in the article, uh, and that's part of the prediction of why it will continue to grow at the rate that it is as far as searching is because of that. Because as more states come on board, it's just going to uh, naturally more people will be searching it. But I, I, I mean, it's a, it's gonna it's a bubble. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a pop. Yeah. It's it's cool. It's the cool thing right mm. now, and they're selling it for everything. And then there's a huge novelty aspect of it where you know, a lot of people have heard about it when and you they say, haven't tried when, it yet. You, when you say bubble stuff, I, I, I don't – sometimes when you reference that, it's it's the wrong time to say it. And what I mean by that is I don't think it's – if it's a bubble and it eventually per, bursts, everything reaches a, a peak and, and, and tops out eventually, right? Everything does. Nothing mm-hmm. nothing goes on forever and keeps rising, rising, rising. Eventually, you you max out on how many people you right. reach. Right, so what are the characteristics so my, of a bubble? So a, a bubble to me is something that bursts and goes all the way back down. When this bursts, I bet you it doesn't even go back down to what it's searching right now. So if it's getting- six, Like plateau. Right, exactly. So if it's getting six million hits right now, I it, and let's just say hypothetically, it, it rises to 100 million hits a month mm-hmm. uh, and the bubble burst- it ain't going to come back down. It's going to come back down, but it ain't going to burst all the way below 6 million. I, it'll, it'll level out at 50 million, so well, it's still going to grow well, way more. Well, so here's why I think it's going to burst, because I know what CBD does. I know what it doesn't do. I know what the other cannabinoids do and what they don't do. And a lot of the products that are out there right now that are getting sold are promising things like fat loss and yeah. muscle recovery, and they're putting it in ice cream, and they're putting it in water, and they're putting it in burgers. It's it, they're diluting selling, the hell out of it. They're selling yeah. it as a novelty. That's what they're selling. So, like, why would you put CBD, for example, in a burger? Yeah. There's no reason well, other than people hear the word CBD and want to try it out. Here's what I think. I think that it's not going to burst because what what I think is going to happen mm-hmm. when it does finally peak and it does, you start to see it slow up or even potentially slowly come back the other direction. Then it's going to start to drive prices down because right now the margins are ridiculous in it. I know what you can make it for, okay? I, I know what it takes to do that, and and extracting CBD is not that expensive. If you have the tools and resources to do it, you can mass produce it, and, and right now, people are making tons of fucking money off of it, and that will eventually end, so... Right, that'll end because you're going to get a lot of people entering the market, they see the margins, but the competition but is because of the how, down. because of how cheap it's going to be and how readily available it will be, because it's a fucking weed that anybody can pretty much grow, I think it'll be around forever, and I think we'll continue to see it in almost everything, and it will become... Like fucking oregano in your in your cupboard, like mm-hmm. it'll just be. Everybody will have it, and you'll just throw it in stuff or use it, or it'll be infused in everything. Like no, I think what's gonna, here's what I think is going to happen uh, is that people are going. More studies going to come out showing that CBD does alter the way that the liver metabolizes certain drugs and vitamins. So there's going to be a little bit of controversy around that. There's going to be studies and stuff that are going to come out saying, hey, CBD does this, but it doesn't do all this other stuff. People are going to have tried it because it's it's everywhere. The novelty will wear off. Where pe- right now, again, if you go to buy ice cream, you've heard of CBD and you see ice cream like this has CBD in it. Let's try it out. You know, yeah. it's got some weed in it or whatever. And then you eat the ice cream, you're like, I don't notice anything. Novelty's over. So I think we're going to see it. It's going to keep climbing. The novelty still is exploding, uh, but at some point, people are going to get over it. The ones that are really getting benefits from it are going to keep using it. But most of the, the the hoopla that's going on right now, that's going to drop off. And you'll just see the market come up and then, boom, drop right back down to the kind of this this baseline. Because although it does have some I just don't application, we, it doesn't I, have these broad, crazy applications. I don't think we've reached selling. a baseline. Oh, no, no. It's still climbing. Yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. That's why climbing. I say it's not like a, a – bu- saying it's going a, a bubble that's going to burst. Well, it, if and when it does, it's, it's going to be still significantly higher. I than, give it five years, five to ten years. That's how that's how much I give it about five to ten years, and I I, I see that the market for it's gonna. Well, I'm curious. I'm curious which states like it's not legal. Like how many are left? There's still a gray area in some states where you can say hemp oil, but you can't say CBD. CBD. Yeah, yeah. Um, because and, and part of that there's this fight to regulate CBD because pharmaceutical companies are selling drugs mm-hmm. that have CBD, and as a pharmaceutical company. You're selling a CBD, a CBD medicine, and then you've got and you com- want to eliminate competition. You've got competitors yeah. who are selling it on the open market, don't require a prescription. 
that's not going to look good for you. You know, you want something that's that's kind of protected. Well, I think that's we're going to see that. Like, it eventually is going to hit like your big pharmaceutical companies, and then mm-hmm. you're going to be able to get like these super potent, high dosed pills that are I, that was already that was already starting to happen yeah. when I was in the club. So yeah, well, it's G- only a matter of time before like you, like your company that you're invested in is going to start putting out pills well, like that for people. They are. They already have. Um, they have. Two, I believe, medications already approved uh, that contain um, CBD. One of them was a more recent one for certain types of epilepsy, especially in, in children. I think I don't remember what the name of it was, but it was a really, really terrible form. And it's got it's very efficacious for it. They're doing a lot of studies on CBD and other uh, issues. There's some cancer studies. There's some autism studies. Um, but what they're going to find, and what they're finding, is that that a combination of cannabinoids is more effective than just purified uh, CBD so I yeah but it's gonna be interesting the part here's what I'm excited for this is what I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to the cancer studies mm. because I've seen the preliminary studies I've seen the animal studies that doesn't guarantee anything but and I've also but I've also heard the anecdotes from people I think what we're gonna see in the future are cannabinoid based cancer therapies that are going to be used in combination with traditional therapy so mm-hmm. rather than taking you know X amount of chemo, you can take half as much chemo if you combine it with these cannabinoids, and it seems yeah, to be to mitigate some of the effects. Not and, only that, but it, it's got a very uh, it's showing effectiveness properties. to kill yeah. yeah the cancer cells. I that's going to be exciting, and the reason why that's exciting is because we haven't seen a no, uh, we really haven't seen something that can reduce chemo or even replace it for cancer treatments. Plus, imagine the news headlines. Yeah, you know, new cancer treatment that doesn't that's non toxic. That'll blow things up. So. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Autism is another interesting one. There's some interesting yeah. studies on, on cannabinoids. There's definitely and a lot of directions it can go. Still, so yeah, I, I'm, I, I definitely think there's. It's going to be a while before we see anything like start to decline. Yeah, I even think five years is an early call. I mean, it takes a long time just for research and studies to happen, and we're going to start seeing more and more yeah. stuff come out. To your point that you're talking about right now, it'll take three to five years just for that. And for the then, for the pharma, yeah, pharma companies will take a long time. Yeah, for sure. So it's, and 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 as more headlines start posting like that, it's only going to drive the cra- for the right because you get the knockoffs. You yeah, know, selling the so yeah. so here's. Here's what I predict. I predict the CBD market will start to top out, and then what they'll do is they'll start to come out with other cannabinoids and hyping the benefits of them. So like mm. CBC, for example, has some pretty interesting effects. It's also non-psychoactive. So a company will come out and say, hey, you know. Do you think that'll happen before we start to get the studies to to, to back up how isolating each one of those compounds is beneficial? Yes, because right now it's all hype. You know, like look at all the co- – look at the vast majority of companies that are selling – CBD products are selling them without any scientific, and they're selling them for reasons that are not backed at all. There's like fitness bodybuilding supplements that contain CBD, and you wonder for what? What's that in there for? It's yeah. just because it's the cool thing, you know. It's the next cool just thing, or whatever. Smash it in there. Yeah. yeah. So no, I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna, they're gonna start selling other cannabinoids uh, isolated, and then people are gonna be like, I tried CBD, but now yeah. let me try. Well, that's why the research CBG is so or- important. So it's like now you know like the true benefits of, of in the usage of it. You know, you can see the direction. You know, you need we need to go with it. Yeah. Well, I, and the other thing I think is I think pharmaceutical companies are gonna start to really figure out how they work, mm-hmm. and then start to synthesize synthetic. Uh, cannabinoids uh, that are not uh, the same ones for two reasons. One, you can patent it because you created it. Yeah. And two, if the pharma industry can figure out a way to maximize the, 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 the good effects and eliminate or minimize the, uh, the, the psychoactive effects, uh-huh. um, then, then that might get pretty interesting because especially with cancer, there seems to be a dose dependent effect. Like the more you take, uh, this is according to the studies I've seen. The more you take, the more of an effect it has on cancer. Mm. But you get limited, right? You can't take, you know, five thousand milligrams of THC because, yeah, you might, you know, maybe it'll have an effect on cancer, but you'll lose your mind. Yeah, which is yeah. I don't know if that's not really a good <laughs> yeah, trade. I don't know if that's a good trade. Yeah. All right. First question is from K Gorski eighty eight. What are some ways to improve squat depth and to not butt wink? Mm, the, the good old butt wink. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we first let's address butt wink butt first, wink. and then we can talk about squat depth because. There, there's a lot of controversy around uh, butt wink. Uh, there's, there's a camp that will say uh, there's, it's very natural. Uh, yeah, for, some of it's okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's, it's very natural to have your your tailbone tuck as you hit, as you hit all the way down in a deep astigrass squat, and that's completely 
natural and normal and safe to do it. And then there's the other camp that's like, oh, any sort of movement in the tailbone uh, at the bottom of a squat is dangerous. Um, in my experience, the way I help somebody figure this out uh, for themselves, if it's something that is potentially dangerous for them, uh, I've found that it's uh, it's really obvious when it's a, it's it's an excessive butt wink. You'll mm. actually feel your it, it, in your uh, erector spinae. You'll feel those muscles. Yeah. So your low back feels like it's on fire. This yeah. was me. So I had a, an excessive butt wink um, when I did really deep squats. So this is when you squat to the bottom and your tailbone tucks. tucks. Yes, that's it. Right, and and that movement. Uh, so anytime I would squat. Uh, and this is how this is how I would tell someone to feel this. And you start light, so you can do is squat light. But if you squat ten or fifteen reps, like the higher reps, that movement of the the, the extending, flexing, extending, and flexing of the hips, uh, the butt wink in and out, will light the low back on fire. And if you feel like that when you squat, your low back feels like it's on fire. There's a pretty good chance that you're having you have an excessive butt wink, and there's work to be done to address there. If you have a slight butt wink or someone tells you that because they want to just sound smart, oh, you have a butt yeah. wink, you need to work on that, and you're like, like I feel it, internet troll. Right, I feel it all in my quads and my glutes, and you don't feel anything in your low back, you're probably you're probably fine. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that that's my uh, my take on the butt wink and the, and the controversy between it as far as it, it, is it a thing, is it a bad thing, is it, is it dangerous as hell? Uh, I think there's examples where it is completely safe and okay, um, when when someone's in a really deep squat for their tailbone, yeah. If you're losing bracing, you know, and, and muscle tension as you're 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 rolling your hips and, and sort of you know tucking them under like that, like that could potentially be a problem. Just for the same fact that if you're dropping down into a squat, you lose tension, you're bouncing up off your joint. Uh, you know, that's that's just going to create these shearing forces you're not distributing properly. Yeah, if you look at the best squatters in the world, uh, power lifters and Olympic lifters, they tend to have no or little butt wink. They really do. You watch them at the bottom, especially Olympic lifters, who's, who Olympic lifters are the deepest squatters uh, in the world. Uh, not because they have to squat that deep, but because it's part of their technique <coughs> to get under the bar the lower you get, the better you're right. going to be at your you're squat. And if, springboard it back and if up. you watch them at the bottom, they have little or no butt wink um, at all. Same thing with powerlifters. Powerlifters don't have to squat quite as low. They just have to get the, the hips to go lower than the knees. But that's the same thing. Now, why can a butt wink increase your risk of injury? And, that, and, and there's, a, there's a distinction between increasing risk of injury and then just saying it's dangerous. Dangerous means don't do it ever. Don't ever do it at all. Uh Increasing risk of injury. Well, that just means that the, the 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 potential to hurt yourself is a little bit higher because there's more moving parts. So when you load a bar on your back and you're squatting down and your spine is totally stable, less risk of injury than if your spine flexes and extends while you're loading weight on top of it. That's just obvious. That's normal. Some people can get away with it more than other people. Now, my the most effective, simple thing I've ever done for clients to help reduce that lumbar, that low back, you know, uh, flexion and extension where the, where the tailbone tucks is a box squat and to use progressively lower and lower boxes. So what I will do is I'll watch my client squat and right before their tailbone tucks, like right, like literally the second the tailbone tucks, I'll get a box that's right about that high and I'll have them practice squatting down without bunk butt wink, sitting on it, and then standing up. Getting good at that, and then what I'll do is I'll progress them to a slightly lower box, slightly lower box. And then I'll have them practice that, and then I'll use a slight, until I can get them down to you know the part, the point where I think we're doing a nice full squat. For me, that's the most simple, easy, basic way to help train yourself mm -hmm. uh, out of a, 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 a butt wink. Now there's more specific applications of exercises and this is do this is this is more specific in the sense that you're identifying your own imbalances so if you have like an ankle mobility issue or a hip flexibility issue then you can do things like 90 90 we have a, a great youtube video on that uh, ankle mobility adam did a phenomenal combat stretch video that that shows you how to improve your your ankle mobility but so i, I don't necessarily think it's bad to have some butt wink some people will, will do it and they're just fine but I, I think I can make the argument that having a totally stable spine is a just a lower risk uh, potential injury. Oh, I think it's like. I think it's ideal no matter what. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think you just have some people that are 
you know, scaring people that, oh my God, you have a butt wink at the bottom. You're that's so dangerous or don't do that or mm-hmm. it's bad. Um, and if, and again, in my experience, it's kind of, it's, it's pretty obvious when it's excessive, you'll, you'll feel the low back on, especially high rep squats. Mm-hmm. You could probably get away with it with low rep, five reps or lower. But once you start getting 10, 15 reps, the repeti- that many repetitions of the flexing, extending of the low back, because that's such a, a unique movement that most people don't train that much. Mm-hmm. You'll feel it, your low back is on fire mm-hmm. from that. And that's your kind of indicator that there's too much, uh, going on there. And to work on that, I love doing, uh, you know, Sal talked about this the other day, like uh, uh, split stance uh, squats, Bulgarian split stance. Um, and why I like that is I teach that to start from the ground up, right? So you get in the- in And you the, keep their spine stable yes. the whole time. Yes, and so I, I get you in that position. I get you all the way at the bottom in the sp- in split, in that split position where your, your, your ankle's hooked up behind the bench or whatever, and your knee is all the way down the ground. And there I, I take a client and I align their posture really well. And then I tell them to brace their core. And this is where I want you to start. And you start from the bottom up and you strengthen one side at a time. Uh, I have found that gives you that really good control of the hips in the in the deepest part of your squat. Uh, that'll help that. It yeah, seems yeah. to me to be more of an instability issue, like for the most part. And so I totally agree with that. And like for me, it's like, I have always wanted similar to like the, a step ladder approach, like you're you're doing with the boxes with that, but more of like just creating more tension and, and pausing in that squat, and you know really getting them to to focus on you know squeezing and you know creating like a more recruitment to then help with the stability of of the hips and then supporting the spine in a low position. Like yeah, that. I mean you know. Here's the thing, butt wink is a little bit natural in the sense that if you watch someone sit in a squat, if you go to, there's some countries where they don't even use like chairs or bus stops, they'll just sit in a squat very, very comfortably. It's natural kind of to roll into that. Butt winking is natural in the sense that when you squat, it opens up things. It's actually a natural way to poop. It's a natural way to give birth. In fact, if you're giving birth and you're squatting, you want to have a butt wink because that opens up Mm -hmm. the birth canal. But the difference is we're not talking about sitting in a natural squat. What we're talking about is loading weight on your spine and then doing resistance training. And there's it's a, there's a big difference between body weight, sitting in a squat, and doing one with weight on your back. So I think it's probably best uh, to do it, uh, to, to try to avoid it or train yourself to not have it when you're doing. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I agree. All right, next question is from Matt White, 15 when doing a bulk phase, how much body fat is too much to gain? What is the ideal fat to muscle gain ratio? The, you know, this is Ooh. this is uh, an interesting question, um, but a good one because I think it's really man, even in the like professional bodybuilding world, it was really common for me to see these guys show up to st- the stage show after show after show after show and kind of look the same but go through these like aggressive bulks and aggressive cuts. And it was in, I remember watching their, their diet and their training and going like, what the fuck are these guys doing? They're literally bulking, putting on 20, 30 pounds and half of it is fat and half of it is muscle or potentially more of it was body fat and a few pounds of muscle. And then when they go the other direction, they would end up at the same starting point mm-hmm. as they were just they were just at, and maybe if they were lucky a half a pound of muscle or a pound of muscle why take your body through that so honestly and i saw some people answering this question on our on our thread uh trying to throw out what they think and uh i think the answer is as little as possible uh my goal when i'm when i'm bulking is i, I it's inevitable i'm going to put some body fat on but I, I, my goal is to only put muscle on and put very, very little body fat. Now, what's challenging about that is the mental aspect. Because when you're in a bulk, and I understand what this is like, because I made this mistake for many years, is you want to see the scale go up. You know, I, if I'm on an, uh, I'm lifting heavier weight and I'm, I'm eating more calories and I'm trying to grow, you know, I want to get on that scale every week and go, oh, I'm up two more pounds. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm up four more pounds. Mm-hmm. And that that's it's telling me I'm growing, right? Or I'm getting bigger. Well, you are getting bigger, but a majority of that is probably water and fat if you're actually gro- if you're actually putting on that much weight. So 
I think a better indicator, and I know Sal alludes to this a lot um, about, is is actually watching your strength gains. I, I'm pretty confident that if my weight on the scale is staying about the same, but I'm getting stronger, and I know that I'm feeding my body a little more calories than what I was doing before and potentially a cut or staying at maintenance, you're probably putting on muscle. And in fact, if you're not putting on a lot of weight on the scale, but weight on the bar is going up and your calories are slightly up, you're probably adding muscle at a really good rate, at a just in the right amount that you may even be leaning out a little bit while you're also building. Now, here's the other part of that, a part because sometimes just eating more calories just makes you stronger, and sometimes gaining body fat makes you stronger, changes your your leverage. I know for me, the heavier I get, the more I can squat almost no matter what. So you think, am I adding more muscle, or is it just because I'm heavier and, and I feel more stable because I have more body fat on my body? So one thing that I would do is I would look at my strength gains, but I would also look at my strength to weight ratio. So if I gain 15 pounds on the scale and I get five pounds stronger, that's not really a good trade in my opinion. I added five pounds to the bar, but I gained 15 pounds of body weight. My strength to weight ratio uh, went down. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I like my strength gains, and they're not going to completely match. You're going to gain more. When you do a bulk, you're going to gain – sometimes more weight than than you'll put on the bar but i think it should be kind of close you know if i if i gain 20 pounds i want at least a 10 or 15 pound gain in my big lifts i don't want to go five pound gain you know see i i approach it the same way that i approach somebody in a cut which is you know somebody who's on a cut i i want them to the goal is to hold on to as much muscle and to lose as much body fat and so i know i'm in control of their diet and their exercise programming so I know that if I just I'm, I'm reducing calories, and I know that I'm they're they're following their program, and the scale is staying the same. I know I'm leaning this person out. Mm -hmm. I, I know I know they're leaning out. In fact, they're probably leaning out at just the right ratio that I might be adding a little bit of muscle while I'm also leaning out, which is is a perfect world. The same thing goes for bulking. I don't want to see a I don't want to see a a big leap in anything. I want to if I know that I'm adding three to five hundred more calories per day, and you're not putting a bunch of weight on the scale. We're probably adding muscle, but what's happening is you're probably also losing body fat, and so it's it's leveling out. So if I can keep adding calories to your diet and actually not see the scale shoot way up and also see strength gains, I know I'm in a very nice sweet spot. I'm getting stronger. My weight isn't going up on the scale. I'm also adding a little bit more calories, and and that, and I'd always I always lean towards the the lower amount first. So start off by only maybe adding 200 something calories a day. And if you still don't see any weight go up on the scale, okay, cool. Let's let's bump up to like 300 or 400 calories. I'm adding more calories still. Oh wow, I'm still not seeing scale. If you've added 500 calories a day and your scale weight isn't going up, but the and you're getting stronger, oh, you're, you're building you're building muscle yeah, at a really good at a very good ratio. Yeah, you're crushing. I don't like to to allow, now. This is personal. This is a bit of an individual variance here too. Because if you're a power lifter, you're probably a little bit looser with how how much body fat you want to gain, right? Yeah, because it's all about your strength and overall. You don't really care about the aesthetics. Yeah, or much. if you're you know if you're just, if you like the way you look, then this may be a little different for you. So I'll give you what my numbers are. Right, I don't like to let myself bulk more than you know 15, 16 percent body fat at most. 15, 16 percent body fat. That for me is about the top of where I allow myself to bulk. And when I cut, when I go down, I like to get down to. Nine or ten percent. Now I've been leaner than that, and I've been fatter than that. But each time, I notice a detriment to how I feel and my health. Now for women, you know, for women, I would say if you're bulking, you probably don't want to go above twenty six percent body fat at most. Women can hold more body fat and be and be healthy. And as far as cutting goes, you know, I know women like to get into the teens, but I typically will tell clients, hey, look, once you get down to about eighteen percent body fat, you probably don't need to go down that much leaner. Maybe sixteen, seventeen percent at the leanest. So you kind of play with that range a little bit, but it's going to be different from person to person and see what you're comfortable with. I also don't like to bulk for more than, you know, eight weeks at a time. Four four or five weeks is, is is the sweet spot for me. Once I go past eight weeks- Then it just now, ends up being a lot of body now fat. Now I'm just gaining body fat, you yeah. know, and I start to lose the the muscle building effects of the of the extra calories. Ideally, here's a great way to bulk. And in, in, in my opinion, I've had a lot of success doing it this way, where you go in a, a calorie surplus for about three weeks- then you do calorie maintenance for about a week, maybe throw in some deficit days here and there, and then go right back on the bulk. So it's kind of a staggered approach, and it, it keeps your body sensitive to the extra calories 
so that it you know tries to build more muscle rather than trying to capture the calories as body fat. I love that. Next question is from Ivoli. How does one get back into nutrition and training after going through a severe traumatic experience? I have taken a break for a month and I'm wondering if decreasing the weight or reps is the best way to bring myself back up to where I was before training and nutrition wise. I, I like this question because, um, you know, we're, this is going to be, you know, this happened, obviously this person, um, had something traumatic happen in their life, but with the Thanksgiving and Christmas, New Year's, uh, I thought this was a, a good question to answer because a lot of people are probably going to be coming off of a one month or two month mm. break from the holidays and are going to be wanting to start the new year, right? And we say this every year, and I'm going to say it again. I, I think one of the most common mistakes made by everybody when they go back into the gym after taking a month or two months or six months off, whatever the time frame is, if it's longer than a month, this is this pretty much reigns true is doing too much too soon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just had a great interview with a, a friend of ours, Max Marzo, and we talked about, you know, the goal of, the, and there, there's really truly a sweet spot on how much you you effort and how much work you do. And when you first get back into training, it takes very little to elicit change in the body. So And doing more doesn't get you faster. Without, right. If anything, it slows down your progress. Exactly. And so... Starting off with like a MAPS anabolic pre-phase or our 30 days of fitness for free that we have on the YouTube channel, you know, I push people in that direction. We, we design those, both the pre-phase and those 30 days of free to really help jumpstart somebody from not working out for 30 days or more yeah. and, and, and ease them into training that it should look more like that. And then you can jump into one of the MAPS programs like full on and follow it. That yeah. would be my recommendation. Yeah, I think I think of it as like going in with a practice mentality. Like, especially if you've had experience training before, you're not like a brand new uh, to the gym, but you want to get back on track. Like, I just look at it. I'm doing all those moves, and I'm I have the same structure for my workouts. I'm obviously I'm not loading quite as much. I'm probably not doing as many reps, but I'm having the intention of it uh, to, you know, get my body reacclimated to those movements again and just kind of work my way through that. But it is hard. It, it, the hardest part of the, is being disciplined enough to stop yourself from doing too much. A lot of times I know like if there's anybody out there that's like me and has that mentality of like, well, like I want to tackle all of this, you know, and like, I, I just want to get, get to where I want to be, uh, you know, that's going to be very, very challenging and, and, and something that, you know, psychologically you have to go in with a plan to, to, you know, really just limit, uh, the amount of volume that you're going to expose yourself to. You have to, you, you have to develop a good relationship with exercise, uh, one that's going to benefit you forever. Okay. So what does that look like? Okay. Well, most people who work out have a relationship with exercise where they look at exercise as a tool to build muscle and burn body fat or as a tool to change how they look. Now, there's not, there isn't anything necessarily incorrect about that because exercise is a tool that also does those things. It is a tool that helps you build muscle, burn body fat, and it is a tool, a very effective tool that will help you change the way you look. But it's a multi-use tool that has far more value than just that. Exercise is a way to de-stress. It's a way to improve your health. It's a way to improve your mobility. It's a way to become more present. Look at exercise and understand all of its value. So you just came out of a traumatic experience. You took a long break because of it. The Probably the best way to view exercise from that point is I want to become healthier. Mm -hmm. Like I just had a shitty thing happen to me. I need to get healthy again. Now look at exercise that way. You're not going to the gym to build muscle. You're not going to the gym to burn body fat and to to look amazing. You're going to feel good. You're going in there to feel good because you just went through this traumatic uh, experience. Going in with that attitude, you're far more likely to use exercise appropriately. So understand that. Now, that approach, here's the irony of that. Here's the cool thing about that is that approach will give you long-term better results on muscle building, fat loss, and looks That's anyway. Right. That's right. Because you're using exercise the most, effect the most effective way you use exercise is to use it appropriately, okay? So if you want to use it in the most effective way possible, use it as appropriately as possible. 
So if you're coming off of a, a long layoff, lots of stress, something bad happened to you, then use it appropriately. Stress relief, becoming present, getting away, improving my mobility, making myself just feel better. Now, that workout looks very different than the one where you go into the gym and saying, I'm trying to get the biggest squat and I'm trying to build the biggest arms or I'm trying to go shred it or get shredded. Those are two different looking workouts, but they're using exercise as a tool. So right now, that's your goal. Look at it differently. Understand its true value. Know what you're going to the gym to accomplish, and that will help drive you in the right direction. Well, I'll give you an example of what that looks like for, for me, too. And I do this even after a, a, a – I rarely take a 30-day break. Uh, a lot of times I have like a two-week break. That's And after a two-week break is enough for me to kind of reset to this this kind of mentality where when you go in, um, that might be a – 20 minutes of it spent on 90-90 combat stretch, some lizard with rotation, a bunch of mobility kind of stretching work. Then I might work my way over to the squat bar, do five five sets or six sets of like some light squats where I'm just working on the movement. Then maybe do some farmer carries, call it a day. That's it. Mm -hmm. that, that might be my first workout back. And that's a very effective workout. I know I haven't done any of my mobility work. That's probably the thing that needs to be addressed more than anything else. I've been sitting in a chair or sitting on a desk or sitting on a couch for the last two or three weeks. And so getting myself mobile and waking everything up and uh, doing that as a priority. And then the things that get the biggest bang for your buck, a squat or a deadlift type of a session. I don't need to do a bunch of other auxiliary work. I'm just going to do one of the biggest bang for my buck exercises, really focus on the movement of it. And I don't need to load the bar super heavy. It's pro I'm probably going to get a little sore just from doing five sets of light squats. Uh, that's enough. Uh, and so I, I I encourage people to to make it look like that when you first start off, and then build on that. You know, the next workout you have a little bit more. The next workout a little bit more, and then eventually you can go into like a fully built out program like a maps program where we you know which are designed to progress you week over week and it's it's more designed for somebody who's kind of already been working out unless you're starting in like the maps anabolic prephase which is why or map starter or map starter mm -hmm. right map starter would be something you could hop into right away uh, and that's why we designed those programs we designed it for people to have that in their tool bag for the moments and the times like this when you haven't been training for a while to utilize the prephase and anabolic or utilize map starter or if you don't have any of our programs, using trying out the 30 days of, of, of free fitness that we did on the YouTube a couple of years ago. Um, that's how I encourage people to get started. Next question is from Catherine B. Fit. Through your years of personal training and experience, what is one major thing each of you has changed your opinion on regarding fitness and or nutrition? Boy, mm. boy, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of things I changed my opinion on um, in regards to fitness and nutrition because you, as you train people through the years, mm. you really start to see what works and what uh, doesn't work. So I'll, I'll pick one. I'll pick one thing that I think was a big change for me. The, the, the first thing was just that uh, anything is better than nothing. That was a big one for me. I remember when I first became a trainer and probably for the first couple of years, if a client came to me and said, oh, I just started walking or a client said, hey, I can only work out once a week. To me, it was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, either you commit or you don't like don't waste your time. And I had this attitude with clients and it was a, an effective attitude for a short period of time. I was very motivating. I was very inspiring. And I'd get people motivated to, you know, for three months or four months to just dedicate, you know, their lives to working out. But then they would drop off like crazy. And I had terrible long term success. Um, I remember when this really became evident. I had a, a client who would, you know, miss workouts. She had a hard schedule. She had kids, all that stuff. And she would make it to the gym maybe once, maybe twice a week. And I remember I had this talk with her once where I told her, hey, if you can't come in three days a week, then you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time. And she left and never came back again. Yeah. And I realized that once a week with me was way better than zero times, right. uh, you know, a week in the gym. And so that was a really big one. Now, when I changed my attitude with this, I became a much more effective trainer. Clients would come to me and they'd say, I can only dedicate this much time or here's what I want to do. And I'd say, no problem. Let's work with that. And then what ended up happening is by meeting them where they were at, I slowly was able to progress them. To, and they actually would progress themselves. Little by little, they come to me and say, hey, I've been consistent once a week now for a while. I feel good. I think I'd like to add an extra day. Or I think I'd like to do stuff on my own. Or I think I'd like to get a little bit more serious with my nutrition. And little by little, the client would let me know 
when they were ready, and sometimes it took years, they would let me know little by little when it was time to progress. And the, the difference was their success became permanent and long-term where people would stay with me for 10 years and then, you know, I, they'd, they'd go off and they'd continue working out for their five or 10 years on their own. Or until this day, I'm, I'm in contact with some of these people who, when they first met me, had no exercise program routine and, and terrible nutrition. And today, 15 years later or 20 years later, they're still doing it on their own. That's when I, that, that was one of the biggest changes I could say that I made in, in my attitude towards fitness. Well, yeah. This I guess this will be a theme here because that's yeah. this is very similar for me. Uh, agreed. There's there's many things that I think we've changed uh, uh, our views on over over the twenty years that everyone's been training for. But I the thing that I think is the most important to convey to everybody listening right now is is along the lines of what you're talking about, Sal. And for me, that was like just walking in general. Uh, I and I've shared this on this podcast multiple times that. You know, a client would come into me, and I, you know, we used to fill out those park cues, and then, you know, asking them questions about, oh, how do you hear about, or how, have you work out? Do you do this? What do you do for fitness now? And uh, the uh, get answers like, oh, I, you know, my husband and I walk three times a week for an hour, and I would scoff at that, like, that's not exercise. Mm -hmm. You're if you do you know how many calories you actually burn when you walk, you know, and then I would I would compare it to you know the treadmill or lifting weights and break down. And you discourage the fuck out of that. right. I totally, so I totally, totally shit on there, and it, and and it was not with intent of that. Like I wasn't like this dick where I was trying to be an asshole. I just I really believed that. I really believed at that time in my life that it was almost a waste of time that if they were going to spend a time for an hour doing something, then your ass should be in the gym and lifting all these heavy weights or on treadmill and doing cardio to burn a bunch of calories. And so that was the message that I was presenting to these people and the reality of it. And, the, and what we talk a lot about on the show is, you know, the way you create long-term behaviors in people is you set these really small obtainable goals that they can start to implement into their lifestyle that then become behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, you know, said trainer and I've got this client who tells me they walk two days a week and they don't do any sort of lifting weights and I'm over here trying to convince them they need to do three to five days of vigorous working out. I mean, like to Sal's point, yeah, I could convince them to do that for three to six month shots you know, and, and hold them and make them pay me to see me three times a week, right? So they shell out thousands of dollars and I get them in good shape in those six months. But then what would happen is they gain it all back. And for me, the, you know, as I looked at that as like, oh, this is great client retention. You know, they, they, they always need me. They need me and, and I'm, I'm going to make more money because they have to see me. So it, opposite. It is. And it took years before I really uh, really realized that and, and realized that I wasn't that good of a trainer. If I wasn't changing people forever yes i could get somebody in shape i understood uh you know i understood physiology i understood nutrition i knew how to to tell someone exactly what to do to get them in great shape but i really wasn't fundamentally changing their life for the better for the rest of their life mm -hmm. and that's when it really hit me and i and now ironically the very and i'll talk people out of doing more days mm -hmm. and tell them to start with less and just walking a lot of times and, and that's because I know this. I know that even though you're coming to me and you're paying all this money to, to, to get started and you want me to push you and get you to your goal as fast as you can, I know if you just if you conveyed to me that the last six months to a year, you haven't been doing anything exercise-wise, your nutrition's been all over the place, I've kind of tracked your movement maybe for the first week, because that's for me, that's, that's first and foremost – uh, and that's something, it's not that it's changed. It's something that I've, I've evolved into doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, when I first meet somebody, I have them log their food and track their steps for the first week. So I have a, a good idea of where this person is at and I don't want them to impress me. So don't go take walks because you're, I'm tracking your steps now. Don't stop eating your Snickers bars or just driving through McDonald's because I'm paying attention. Do your normal week. I, I want to see this is very important. I say that. And then I look at it, and from there, I make very, very subtle changes. And and that took me a long time to get to that place where I realized how effective that was in comparison. Sure, uh, if I was racing the old version of me, the old version would get somebody to, in better shape faster in three months because I would, you know, motivate them, mm -hmm. you know, and and push them to get there. 
but that that person, the success rate long term was probably less than 15 percent or 10 percent, where now it may take me longer than three months to get that person to where they want to be. But instead of only being able to keep that person there for the rest of their life, 10 or 15 percent, the success rate was more like 80 mm-hmm. percent. Now, when I, I, I take longer to get them to where they want to be. But by the time they got to where they want to be, they have they have now created all these new behaviors in their life that they maintain that for the rest of their life. And of all the things that I've changed and done different or gone back on or said to me, that the most important message is that one is that. And, the, and it goes along the lines of the last question that we just answered of how you start off this New Year's of just slowly, uh, uh, incrementally adding more and more to your, your uh, workout routine. Yeah, I think that's just part of the maturity of you know through the evolution of working with so many people you just you realize what actually works and what works is is you really have to reduce what you present uh you know to your average person so they're just not constantly swimming in all these different options and feel overwhelmed and i think through you know the the career i started out like having to write down every single workout and I wrote everything down to the T. So I, I'm like super, super planned out. And then, you know, the next evolution was that was basically throwing that away and mm. and now having the, the flexibility to, you know, work on the fly. And then what's, you know, what's appropriate for that day. And it doesn't, I was trying to work my clients into my system and then realized I had to work with them, you know, within those parameters. And then later I threw that whole system away and, and just really just tried to focus in on the individual of like, like what, like, what do you do? Like, what do you eat? What do you do? I need to really like peer into that and, and, and understand you, uh, you know, what, what you're coming in with. So I can then create this hierarchy. I can create the, the priority list of things to address. If there's any pain, that's one of them, right? If, if there's, you know, like a gross offender, you know, nutritionally, like we're going to look at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if there's just little things like throughout your day, we can just do one little thing. Like, let's do that thing. Yeah, you know, and so it's it's and it sounds so vague in general, but um, honestly, it's that's what's been the most successful with all the clients that have then continued on, and they've really adopted the concepts because it's 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 freeing. It's freeing in knowing that that every day you can you can just make a little adjustment, and it's gonna like do massive things uh, down the road. Yeah. Do do you? Here's another big one that I'm, I'm thinking about right now, and it's it's actually a massive shift because when I first started training people, I thought motivation and inspiration were the key. I thought that was the most important thing. I thought mm-hmm. if I can just motivate and inspire people, that they then would become fitness fanatics uh, like me. And now here's the shift. I so I it took me a long time to realize that motivation and inspiration were actually not important at all. They, it went from being the most important thing that I thought mm-hmm. not important. to becoming the it's one of the least important things. Now, you, you may be listening and thinking, what do you mean by that? I thought motivation and inspiration were, were important. Okay, here's why they're not important. First off, they're fun and awesome when you have them. If you're motivated and inspired, you don't need uh, anybody to push you. You really don't need structure. You just go. You do it. And this is why you know Adam said, I have to so now I talk clients out of working out uh, so much when they first come see me because they're riding a wave of motivation and inspiration. They walk into the gym on this sudden wave of motivation and inspiration. They're talking to a trainer like, okay, that's it. I'm ready. I'm ready to work out five days a week. He's like, well, what do you, how much are you working out now? Zero days a week. Okay. <laughs> You're going, we're, we're, we're starting too, too fast. Now, now why is motivation and inspiration bullshit? Because it goes away. It's a feeling. It goes away. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to go away. Nobody stays motivated and inspired forever. It's just like you're not going to be happy or sad And forever. all you're left with are the behaviors That's you've it. created. You're, so what happens when you ride that wave of motivation and inspiration, you place tons of value on it? What happens when it's gone? You stop. Yeah. And this is the biggest problem with the fitness space. The biggest problem with the fitness space is it pushes- They cash in on that. Uh, so much. It's all about motive. It's all the workouts are fun and exciting. You get in here. You can do it and you can- you can do anything you put your mind to, and it, you're going to change your life, and it's great. And it sounds awesome, and it's exciting, but what ends up happening is people start and stop, start and stop. I mean, you know, we say we have a, 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 a body fat or weight gain problem in this country. We actually don't. Uh, 
we have a you know we have a weight loss problem not because we can't lose weight people lose weight all the time they can't keep it off they gain it and they gain it back and it's because of that right there so once i learn that oh motivation inspiration is actually not important. I'm going to try and figure out behaviors that you can continue when the motivation goes away. Yeah. That's why you start so slow. Yeah. Because like when this motivation is gone, Mrs. Johnson, when you're not motivated anymore, how many days a week you think you can make it to the gym? Not five. Maybe probably not even three. How about one day a week? Do you think you make it? Do you can you make it one day a week here to train to work out for the rest of your life during those periods of time when you're not motivated, when you're sad, when you're depressed? When you're tired, do you think you can make it once a week? If it, if that's a yes, that's where we're going to start right there. I'll give you another one that I know that you guys both do that um, I guarantee you didn't do early on and that we all do differently now that was probably a, a massive game changer for all of us. Uh, and that's related to nutrition since we didn't talk a lot about nutrition. the When I started to um, – when I first started, I would look at somebody's, I would do all the calculations. Oh, you weigh 140 pounds, you're this percent body fat, you, you're you considered uh, sedentary, you're going to be exercised this much. Okay, you need uh, 1,400 calories, this many grams of protein, this many grams of protein, to mm -hmm. lose weight, and I would write out a diet. Here's your diet, follow your diet. That has completely changed how I take somebody uh, through a nutrition plan, and it's almost seems opposite of what you would think when you have somebody. So I get somebody now who comes in and they want to lose body fat and I actually look at their diet and then I add, which seems crazy because this person is coming to lose weight. The thought of adding food to their, their diet uh, would be counterproductive. It's not though. And, and this is something that it took me years to piece this together because what happens to somebody when you tell them to not eat certain foods and to follow this, it promotes the the binge and the restrict uh, wave of the yo-yo dieting where, okay, if I know I can not do this, not do that, not do this, not do this, and eat all these weird foods I don't really care for for a matter of six months, but then eventually you go back to all the other bad behaviors. It relies and, on willpower. Exactly. It's all about willpower. It's all willpower at that point, whereas... I and it's it was it was kind of like a reverse psychology that I would do on the clients is instead of telling them no you can't have McDonald's no you can't have these things I would say I would look at the diet and see what they were lacking the most you know maybe they're not getting enough fiber maybe they're not getting enough lean protein maybe they're not getting enough healthy fats whatever it was I would look and see what they're not getting enough of because what's here's what happens when you eat a bunch of shitty food and this is what the, why there is such thing as good food and bad food. I know there's a lot of people that hate that and say that it doesn't exist. Yes, it does. There's foods that are super high in calories and they provide very little nutrient value. That to me is crappy food. Food that is lower in calories provides lots of nutrients. That is good food. So when someone has a diet full of crappy food, they're getting lots of calories, but they're not getting a lot of the nutrients that their body needs. And so I would look in areas where they're they're lacking the nutrients that their body needs to be functioning really well, and I'd have them add. And a lot of the most common offenders are like I, I listed off, like not enough fiber, not enough good protein, not a good healthy fats. And so I would look at it and say, okay, Susie, what I want you to do is don't worry about all the other things you're eating, but every day I want you to make sure that you get this giant salad, and I want this in there. I want an avocado in there. I want this in it, mm -hmm. and, I, and you know, I want four ounces of chicken. I would give them something, and they're like, that's it? I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, no, everything else, whatever, just every day make sure you add that. And what ends up happening is they're like, this is awesome. I'm the best trainer in the world. He didn't tell me I can't have my McDonald's. He didn't tell me I can't have this. All I have to do is make sure I get a salad. I can fucking do that. It all of a sudden becomes this real easy task for them to do. And what I know is that when they start to eat that meal, it naturally ends up replacing something else that I know that isn't yeah. nutrient dense. Yep, yep. They start mm -hmm. to reduce the intake of shitty food. I mean, I would add glasses of water. They start to build a palate yeah. for it too. I, I, yeah. I would add vegetables. Um, right. And then maybe I'd throw in a, like, a, hey, you know, do this before lunch. Do me a favor and eat, you know, two cups of cooked broccoli. Mm -hmm. You know, before you eat your lunch, just add this to your diet. Right, you don't yeah. have to change anything else. And it would naturally get them to want to eat less. But you're, uh -huh. it's so funny too because the old way, the way that we yeah. were taught, which was here's your calories, proteins, fats, carbs. Yeah. Get rid of this, 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 this. Yeah. Here's your new diet. Here's your diet plan. This is what you're going to eat every day. The worst, that's the worst approach. It's completely foreign to what they would normally it's do. It's actually yeah. the worst possible approach. It's actually even worse than telling someone to cut carbs 
or cut fat. It really is because it's yeah. way more – you're making way a lot of changes all at once. That's right. And then you're telling – essentially, the client has to rely on their willpower to do it. And I don't care who you are. You could have the best, strongest willpower in the world. At, at some point, your willpower is going to break. And then that 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 party is going to come out. That's free, yeah. and then you do it like. Well, that's why I have a problem with all diets. I mean, I just have always had a problem with that because it just isn't. I mean, it doesn't reflect what they would do on a, a normal day to day basis, and it's just so limited. Unless you have some kind of a medical issue where we're addressing this, you know, through food and nutrition. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, like this has to be sustainable. This has to be it's something that you're going to incorporate in your life. You know, then on out. Mm-hmm. So like. How what does that even look like? Like, how can we create that and build little tiny steps towards that? Yeah, your job as a trainer is not to get someone to lose 30 pounds or gain 10 pounds of muscle or become super mobile or super strong. That's not the primary job that you have. I know it's part of it. It's not the primary goal. Your primary goal is to guide the client to developing a relationship with exercise and nutrition that allows them to lead a healthy life forever on their own without you. That's your goal. And the most effective way to do that is exactly what we're talking about. And I apologize to all the clients that I trained the first five years that I trained. (laughs) Me too. Because I did it all wrong and I was a terrible guy that was all about fat loss, muscle gain, and that kind of stuff. So, And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our resources and guides. They're all totally free. Go check them out. You can also check all of us out on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.